Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight for another candidate forum during this important election season. We want to welcome to the Center for Politics and the People and to Ripon College our Congressman, Representative Glenn Brothman of the 6th Congressional District. He's running on the Republican Party ticket for re-election. We tried to get both Representative Brothman and his opponent, Sarah Lloyd, together. It didn't work out with scheduling. She was here two weeks ago, so tonight we have Representative Brothman. Um, prior to his election to Congress in 2014, Representative Brothman served in the Wisconsin State Assembly, representing the 58th Assembly District from 1993 until 2005. He served as the Vice Chair of the Assembly's Republican Caucus from 1999 to 2004. Later, after being elected to the Wisconsin State Senate from the 20th District from, uh, in 2005, he served as Assistant Majority Leader from 2011 to 2015. Representative Grothman is a lifelong Wisconsinite and serves on the House Budget Committee, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, the Education and Workforce Committee, and the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress. Through his committee work, Representative Grothman has pursued options for making higher education more affordable, expanded educational opportunities in technical fields, and continually advocates for jobs and education reform. So we thank you for coming tonight. We welcome you. Um, take as much time as you wish. Afterwards, um, our, the publisher of Ripon Commonwealth Press, Tim Like, will ask you some questions. Then we'll open it up for the audience for their conversation with you. Okay. Thanks. Well, so it's much. a little bit different than I thought. And I, I was under the impression this was more of an update, not a campaign thing. But uh, that's what we're told. But I, I will kind of talk a little bit about what it's like to be in Congress. Talk a little bit about the education issue. And uh, then uh, open it up for questions as far as what it's like to be in Congress. Um, you guys can hear it? Or is this for what? It's not on. No, it's not. You switch it on. Okay. Um, okay. Tell you a little bit of what it's like to be the first two years in Congress. So give my opinions on education. And uh, if you want to, even though you know, we, we treated this as an official thing, because that's what was explained, we talk a little bit about the campaign to rest. That's not what we thought. Okay. Um, as I said, I'm your congressman. Uh, many of you some remember Tom P. Try, who had represented this area in Congress for 34 years. I'm relatively new here. I've been representing this area for a little over a year and a half. As was mentioned, I had a great deal of experience in the state legislature. I was there for 21 years. And of course, being in Congress, I can't help but make comparisons between the two. So. Uh, We'll talk about that a little bit, the difference between the two. Um, as far as I can see, uh, there are some areas in which the state legislature is like the Congress, and some areas that they're different. I would have to say in almost every way, uh, your state legislature in Madison is more well run than uh, the situation in Washington. You can talk about some of the differences. Um, in both, so I'll tell you a little bit about the way my, what my job consists of. In an average month, we are um, spending about three weeks in Washington and one week back here. I make a point of coming home every weekend. I haven't gone on any trips like so many of the congressmen do. And I, I didn't want to do that for at least the first two years on the job because I want to give as many of you as possible a chance to get to know me. As in Madison, most of the work is done on a committee level, okay? And I am, as mentioned, on four committees. I'm on the Government Oversight Committee, which deals with a lot of government scandals. And if you're a C-SPAN junkie, you know, I've been on there dealing with uh, the Hillary Clinton scandal, dealing with Flint, Michigan, uh, dealing with some of the other EPA scandals as far as uh, the human resources, um, problems they've had with their human resources department, uh, dealing with some of the Secret Service scandals, uh, dealing with TSA, that sort of thing. In the committee that's maybe most important to people here as far as uh, um, <clears throat> is the Education and Workforce Development Committee. Part of that committee, Workforce Development, deals with labor laws, but part of it deals with education. And that's the federal involvement in K-12 education, tech schools, university, the whole thing. The third committee uh, is the Economic Committee, or we just in general hear testimony as far as 
uh, testimony as to how the government is affected by, or the, the economy is affected by government programs, and finally the budget committee. The budget committee is an important committee as it sounds, because all it does is set the overall level of spending. Nevertheless, I think it's important to be on the budget committee because I think everybody around here cares about the next generation, has to be concerned about our huge debt. The last budget that we passed was expected to have about 14% of that budget borrowed. Given that we have a $19 trillion debt, you shouldn't be passing any budget in which you're borrowing more at all, right? You should be trying to work it off. And I think the budget committee provides a good education for our freshmen as to where the money is going. Um, there are some things that make it a little bit more difficult to get things done in Congress. I consider myself a very bipartisan legislature and e legislator. I've been e eager to work with Democrats as I continue to on my policy for Madison. Nevertheless, unlike the state legislature and things like your county board, your, um, your local school board, a majority does not rule the Senate. It takes 60 votes to pass almost everything in the Senate which means things go a lot more slower. It also means that everything we do, or almost everything we do in Washington, is bipartisan. Whenever people tell me, oh, we do bipartisan in Washington, unlike Madison, everything has to be bipartisan. Because in order to pass something out of the Senate, um, we need 60 votes. And right now the Republicans have a 54-46 majority, but you cannot pass anything without 60 votes. So it means a practical matter, whatever you hear going on in Washington, being it passed individual appropriation bills, be it the big education bills that we've passed already, all of those things. Big transportation bill, which was the most significant transportation bill in about 10 years, big Medicare reform bill, all of these were bipartisan. Uh, and that does not have to be that way in Madison. Now the downside of that is it's harder to get things done. Okay, and you have 100 votes in the, in the U.S. Senate. To get 54 Republicans, maybe not that difficult. To get 50 more Republicans and six Democrats, more difficult. It has been done. It has to be done to pass the budget every year. But obviously, a lot of big things that people in the room, maybe a Republican <coughs> that on have passed, are not going to pass because you need to pick up, well, we really need here to read to sign off. So that's one way in which things are very different in, um, in Washington than Madison. And one of the reasons why I think you see so many things getting done in Madison right now and it may seem like not much is getting, as much is getting done in Washington, though they have to have a relative amount. Another thing that's different is in Madison, your budget, which is the most important thing, is passed in one bill, okay? Every 10 years in Madison, or I mean, I'm sorry, every two years in Madison, one budget bill is passed. In Washington, they take what they call the budget, which is just a set amount, and they break it into 12 appropriation bills. So you have, you know, of really 12 different budget bills being passed. Now, a lot of times what happens if that's not done at the end of the two-year period, they do an omnibus bill and wrap up everything else, but one more time you can see a big difference. It is also true in Washington that we pass a budget every year. In Madison, they pass a budget every two years. Um, I'll talk a little bit about education and I'll talk other things that are a problem. But I will say, whenever you discuss anything, this huge debt has to be something you take, you take into account, okay? And remember, right now, we're borrowing 14% of the budget. In our budget, about two-thirds of the budget is what they call mandatory spending. Mandatory spending is not exclusively, but is largely things that you are entitled to <coughs> under current law by filling out a government form. Some of those things are things that we have a strong moral obligation to do because they're things you, you've paid your whole life for. Medicare, Social Security, would be things that we would consider mandatory spending, right? And regardless of what Congress does every year, that spending goes on ahead even if the government shuts down because that's our current obligation. In order to change any of those programs, you would need a separate bill that the president would sign. About one-third of your budget is what's called discretionary spending, and that's what we vote on every year. In that discretionary spending, about half is military, and half is non-military. This is one of these unwritten rules they have in Congress and it's sometimes kind of frustrating because right now our military spending is giving us you know, the smallest airport, air force measured by number of planes in, in decades, a smaller navy than in decades, a smaller army than in decades. Um, to a certain extent that's because we've had some sequester rules before I got there, 
that uh, every year the amount of spending goes down a small amount. However, it has created a situation in which if you're concerned about defending the country, ultimately uh, some of that spending has got to go back up. And it does mean that if military spending goes up, as long as both sides stick to that informal agreement that's 50-50, non-military spending has to go up as well. When I say, another thing to remember is, when I say that 14% of your federal budget is borrowed, that's with interest rates at an, an all-time low, right? And who's the biggest debtor in the country? Uncle Sam. So when we look at interest rates being historically low, you have to remember, this probably can't go on forever. And when interest rates go up, we are going to be squeezed even more when we say we're borrowing 14% of the budget. It's also true because Social Security and Medicare is such a large segment of the budget, over time, as more and more people turn 65 and tap into Social Security, tap into Medicare, that amount's going to go up. And I don't think any politicians at any time in the future uh, are going to want to reduce Social Security, nor should they, because it's a commitment we've made. But it gives an indication that when you deal with any programs uh, in that discretionary window, you have to be very careful before you adapt big new things. Um, you know, I, I do consider myself a bipartisan legislator, but when you hear politicians talk about new college for everybody, or new college for everybody making under $120 million or something, I am skeptical. And quite frankly, it's a problem that uh, affects not only the Democrats, but the Republicans, in that it is fun to spend other people's money. Calvin Coolidge once said, there are a few things more enjoyable than spending other people's money. And one of the things that surprised me when I got to Washington is even given this huge amount of debt, even when the Republicans meet alone, so many of my colleagues think, I've got a good idea, and that idea is a new program that's going to cost more money. And I'm thinking, hey, wait a minute, folks, we're borrowing 14% of the budget already. I mean, maybe if you want to come up with a new program, you ought to call your state legislator, or maybe your county board or something, that they may not be in debt like we are, but we're not the ones to do it. But in any event, there still is always a demand for more and more spending in Washington. And it's something that I've always kind of fought, because just like in your own life, if you were borrowing 14% of what you spent last year, you know, if you had a, a spouse thinking that way, you'd have to tell the other spouse, hey, wait a minute here. You know, I mean, we're already in debt. The credit card is going up, 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 up every month. I don't care how good it sounds. you got to be a little bit more skeptical. Um, as far as education is concerned, I, and we'll come around to the university in a second, we've made a, a, a lot of progress, I think, on K-12 education. Um, we have had, over a long period of time, a commitment particularly in the area of special education, and particularly in the area of the school districts in poverty, the federal government uh, funds part of it. Um, and we have um, we passed a major bill, uh, a major education bill, update bill, probably the most significant education bill in the last 13 years. I am on the education committee. I was glad to be part of it. One of the complaints you get, and it's not just true of education, it's true of everywhere else. When the federal government begins to give money, there's a blizzard of paperwork that goes with it. So my major goal in that K-12 education bill was to get the federal government less involved in education. I think I succeeded in that. Um, the Wall Street Journal called our, every, uh, our Student Success Act. They called it the greatest uh, devolution of federal power from the federal government to the states in the last 30 years. I'm not sure what that was better than, but I was glad to be part of getting the federal government out of K-12 education to a degree. Um, the big area was we got rid of what used to be called Common Core, and which federal requirements as to what the, what tests the states would have to use to measure success. Obviously, if the federal government is going to be prescribing what tests you use, the federal government is, in essence, going to be able to dictate curriculum, right? Because they're going to say, you know, this is how we're going to determine whether Ripon High School is a success or a failure. Ripon High School pretty much has to teach to the test to prove they're not a failure. So I felt that was a big, a big improvement. We took the number of programs that um, you can ask for grants for. We greatly shrunk it to a smaller number of grants. I always feel to a degree grant writing is a little bit of a waste of anybody's resources. I mean, if anybody has been part of any nonprofit organization trying to get grants, you know it takes a lot of time. And so far as we can streamline that process, we have less programs with the same amount of money. I always think that's a good thing. So that was another way to move the ball, I felt, in the right, uh, the right direction. One thing to get out of that program is the Student Success Act is a successor to No Child Left Behind. I don't know how many of you remember No Child Left Behind. That was a, uh, a program passed under George Bush, but written by Ted Kennedy. It was passed, I believe, in 
either 2002 or 2003. I believe it passed in 2002. And it was the, the, the biggest expansion of federal government in K-12 education, <coughs> uh, probably in my lifetime, in my opinion, after the federal government originally got involved in education in a big way um, under President Johnson. There was another big increase under President Carter. By, I think as far as federal control was concerned, it was a big increase. People knew uh, within six months after George Bush signed that bill that it was a problem, that it was too much paperwork, that it was too much federal involvement in local schools. It nevertheless took us uh, 12 or 13 years to make a significant adjustment to that bill. And that tells you something. Because when they originally passed that bill, it was supposed to be good for seven years. But it shows that whenever the federal government does something, it is very, very difficult to change it. And the lesson all you kids ought to take out of that is never, ever, ever want the federal government to get more involved in things. Because unlike if you ask the people in Madison or the people in Fond du Lac for more money, when they make a mistake, they can change it in a year or two years. The federal government, even when everybody under the sun knows that a program isn't working, it still takes them 13 or 14 years to get it right. And uh, so, but that was probably the most significant thing that happened on the education committee. We are also going to be looking at K-12, um, at university education. Uh, the major thing that they are, there are two things they're looking at there, but one of them is student loans. And it is one of the great scandals of my time that so many kids have such huge student loan debt. I mean, it puts you in a situation in which you are told you're doing the right thing, right? We always tell kids, or not always, but maybe too frequently tell kids, you ought to go to college, you know, that's a, the way to success. <coughs> we know right now that there are a lot of kids graduating from college who are not getting the college sort of jobs that they wanted. I was talking a little while ago to a friend of mine. Uh, his son went to college to become a sports journalist. Isn't that fun? Hmm. A sports journalist making money interviewing the Packers, man. A lot of fun. Um, but not surprising, or not surprising, I think, to anybody who thinks about it, there are a lot more people who want to make their living interviewing the Packers than there are jobs interviewing the Packers. So this guy has now got a nice, honorable job. Uh, he's working uh, in a factory, making forty or forty-five thousand dollars a year. But eight years after he graduated with college, he's still got a significant loan debt, and he's not making any money at all on a sports marketing degree. So I think one of the goals we have to do, a couple of goals. First of all, I think we have to do a better job of making sure that people go to college have a goal for getting a job. Okay, and I think over time, more and more universities are realizing that. It can't be like when I went to school and everybody got a psychology degree or communications arts degree and could expect to get a job somewhere. We cannot have people graduating from college and then farfling around, what am I going to do? Um, I, know, I know a couple, um, both of them got married after getting degrees in the arts field between them. Uh, they have $150,000 in debt. I mean, I don't know when that couple's going to have kids, they want to have kids. We don't even have kids, we've got to pay up $150,000 in debt, and both of you have a degree that may not necessarily lead to a very good paying job. Um, there are a variety of things I think we can do to nip at the edges there. One thing, I think we ought to be able to allow students to refinance their debt. Now, I'm being a little bit bipartisan here. A lot of Republicans don't feel they should be able to do that. But you refinance your debt, or your parents refinance their debt on their house as interest rates go down. The reason some people don't want to do it is they feel it would cost the government more money. Why would that cost the government more money? Because right now so much of the student loan debt is held by the government. So if we cut the interest rates, the government's going to lose money. My opinion has been, I have seen enough waste in government that the idea that we are having artificially high interest rates on kids who have sometimes been misled into getting a college degree that's not that valuable, I think is a big mistake. So when we try to pass our appropriation bill on the education, I want to do what I can to see, even though it's going to supposedly cost more, cost more money, to find that money somewhere else and allow us to reduce the interest rates. The other thing that people have asked for and I'm trying to get done is allow the universities to weigh in more and maybe even sign off before kids get more student loan debt. Um, I think some people not only get degrees that aren't the best, but some people use college loans for things that are maybe unrelated to college. I went to college a couple times myself, and I remember some of my friends who may have lived kind of a higher lifestyle than they had to in college. 
And if you can have, you know, get, take out as much of a student loan as you want, sometimes people are tempted to buy, you know, new electronics, um, you know, live a little higher lifestyle, maybe take a nicer spring break. I think insofar as the universities can wait, and I got this idea from some of the universities, maybe they can say, hey, wait a minute, you know, you don't need this entire amount, I'm looking at your, you know, your balance sheet, and while it may be enjoyable to take out another three or four thousand dollars here, I think you can make do without because you're going to wish you had that three or four thousand dollars when you're 25 or 26 years old, even though now that you're 19 years old, you feel that you can use it. So those are things that I'm working for. Uh, in these programs, another thing that we can look at and maybe a place we can find some of the money is right now the federal government operates a program called Pell Grants. And Pell Grants are grants to lower income students. Until about five years ago, Pell Grants were what they call a discretionary program. In other words, every year the federal government said, this is the amount we're going to spend on Pell Grants. At the time, they changed, which is a responsible thing to do, right, in your own budget. You don't say, I'm going to put an item on my budget, the sky is the limit. Okay, about five years ago, Congress changed that, not to be partisan, but it was kind of when the Democrats controlled everything, my good friends. And uh, as a result, the number of Pell Grants began to shoot up. I think right now you could argue that some of these Pell Grants are going to kids who look at their test scores, and predictably they're not going to necessarily graduate. I think it might be better in some cases to have kids maybe take out loans for the first year, and we'll give you Pell Grants when you show that you can work your way through. Because a lot of, right now, um, a, lot of, a lot of kids who aren't eligible for Pell Grants are taking out student loans, paying their own way, and I think we're going to help uh, some of the kids with less money Maybe we ought to have them do that for the first one or two years and then weigh in Pell Grants later on rather than give Pell Grants to kids who in some cases almost predictably are not graduating uh, anyway. Maybe that's one way we can get this money so that the interest rates from the other kids can drop a little bit. But that's uh, a little bit about the background of things that are going on in student debt. I do, apart from what I'm doing as congressman, tell the same thing to every student right now. Make sure, and I think a lot of students in the audience, make sure you have a plan when you go to college. Okay, just don't kind of muddle through and say, I'm taking electives here, I'm electives here, I'm electives here, and wind up with a, nothing against it, but a communication arts degree or a psychology degree, and all of a sudden you're $50,000 in debt and going to show for it. Do what you can to aim for a degree in which you're going to get a job. Do all you can to get some sort of job in summers or while you're here, an internship which you begin to establish uh, connections in, in the real world so that when you graduate, you don't only have that recommendation, but maybe keep a job lined up. Because it's just heartbreaking to see so many young people, $50,000 in debt, and you know working for 11 bucks at the local mall. And I don't want to have anybody in here wind up in that situation. Um, a little bit as far as other issues that are of interest to me, when I ran, I ran a great deal on the idea of welfare reform. Welfare, whatever that means, be it food share, be it W-2, uh, be it earned income tax credit, um, right now I think is having a perverse effect on our society in two big ways. First of all, so many government programs are designed to be phased out as you make more money. And if you add up the food share and the low income housing, the Badger Care and the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is something you get if you work a little but not very much. Um, you add up those programs, and it can be $30,000, $35,000 cash value for people. Daycare if you're working part-time. Well, when you tell somebody, when you start them out at, at $30,000 or $35,000 and say, as you work less, we're going to take that away, well, guess what? You wind a situation in which you are strongly discouraged from working hard. And if you talk to any, or most employers that I talk to, if they're having jobs in that $10, $15 range, they will give you all sorts of anecdotes of people who don't want to work harder or don't want raises because they know the more money they make, they begin to take away these other programs. That is the first huge mistake because we want everybody in our society to be successful. We feel, I think everybody here probably feels better about their job. I know I feel good to have my job. It wouldn't feel as good if I was sitting at home collecting a government check. So we want everybody to have that experience. Not to have that experience in their own right, but to have the experience for their children, right? The most important thing all parents give their children is a good example. And 
that. I always feel that way. You know, there's some things as a parent that you consciously give your kids. You know, maybe I'm going to coach my kids' soccer, soccer team, or I'm going to pay for my kids' piano lessons, or pay for my kids' tuition. That's something we consciously give our kids. But the most important thing we give our kids is a good example. And when the government pays people not to work, in other words, we, we pay parents to, to provide an example of either not working or working only part-time when they're capable of working full-time, we're really doing a disservice to the kids of the next generation. The next problem we have on all those programs is almost all of them, they create a penalty if you get married. And while there are many wonderful single parents out there, we know over time, in general, it's better for the kids um, if you have an old-fashioned leave to be for family, right? And right now we have a situation, which it's not hard to find anecdotal evidence, of people who have children and they begin to realize how many of these benefits are, and they pretty soon begin to catch on that if you get married and one spouse has a good paying job, a forty to $50,000 a year job, those benefits disappear. That if you stay unmarried and one parent is only working a small amount, making ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year, you can get a lot of benefits as well. A downside of this is right now we are encouraging, it's again, not hard to find anecdotal evidence, encouraging uh, some people to have children out of wedlock and raise kids in that environment. That's a, that, well there are, I know so many wonderful single moms, single dads out there, but overall it makes things much more difficult than raising that child, and it's also a way to hurt the children. And I think we have to look at these programs and adjust them so we no longer discourage work and no longer discourage marriage. The uh, next thing I'll talk about on my campaign is we have a problem right now in immigration. America needs immigrants. And you know, I we have any immigrants in the room? I love talking, so he's, he's the expert. He'll know more about America than everybody because he can see America. Can I ask what country you're from? Germany. Germany, okay. He can look at America and look at it and compare it to Germany and, you know, Germany's a pretty great country, but a lot of times I love to talk to immigrants about America because they know the best things about America because they have a point of reference, right? If you moved here from Honduras or moved here from Nigeria or moved here from Afghanistan, you can really appreciate America and the way people who were born here do not. On the other hand, we do want to make sure that we pick our immigrants. We're picking people who are, to the greatest degree, an asset to this country. Um, the land is not a partisan issue, and during the last two presidents, maybe the last three presidents, there hasn't been a priority on enforcing the immigration laws, and that's a problem. Okay, right now, if we have a situation in which we can pick before, let's say somebody coming from Mexico, somebody who is going through filling out the forms, going through a 12-year waiting period, and picking somebody who snuck across the border, I don't think it's difficult to say America as a whole would be better off, you know, vetting people and taking the type of people who fill out the forms rather than people who sneak across the border. Not to mention, it's unfair to people who are filling out the forms to have people jump ahead of them who are breaking the law. So I think we have to do something about our current immigration situation. No country can exist if you just have an open, board, open borders policy across the board. I mentioned a while ago that I was on the government oversight committee. We've had several hearings on immigration and things in which the current system is, is muddled up. One way is that right now we don't penalize anybody no matter how many times they get across the border. Um, this is very frustrating for the Border Patrol, as you can imagine. You catch somebody, you send them back, they come back again. Oh, my goodness, I see you here yesterday. You go back, you come back the next time, you kick you out, you come back again. And, you know, very frustrating being a border guard. Other countries penalize people for trying to come across too much, and we should be doing that. The second thing is, I said we want to have immigrants improve America. And right now in America, even when you commit a crime, and go to prison, the government does not necessarily kick you out. You know, maybe you go to the Oxford Federal Prison, which is a little bit west of here. Maybe you spend seven or eight years in prison for a really heinous crime. You would figure, well, now since you're here illegally, we sure don't want you. We sure want you out of here. <coughs> that does not happen anywhere near as much as you want. Another problem we have is even when the government does decide to kick a criminal out of here who's here illegally, maybe the country on the other end won't take them back. That's true of some Middle Eastern countries. It's true of some African countries, Sub-Saharan countries. Um, true of Cuba, okay? Uh, perhaps if somebody commits a horrible crime, child abuse or something, the United States says, well, we caught you, we sent you to prison for eight years, now we have decided we don't want you to be in America anymore, you shouldn't be here in the first place, 
We're sending it back to Cuba. Cuba may say, hey, we're not taking this person back. We don't want him back in our country. <laughs> well, Congress a while ago passed a law that says that we have the ability to withhold any visas from that country if they are not going to take back their criminals. Mm -hmm. The chief executive is, in the recent past, never using that tool that's given to him. I mean, to me, you know, I'd like to enforce your immigration laws in the first place. But if you're not going to enforce them across the board, at least if you had a horrible crime, send people back. You know, send people back to Afghanistan or, or, uh, or Cuba or, you know, countries in Africa. I think what we ought to do is we ought to force the chief executive to use that tool because every country wants to be able to issue visas to come into this country. And I think when, it, it, when the threat is appropriately applied, these criminals will be kicked out of our country. But in any event, I think we have to do something about that. The third thing I think that is a high priority, uh, a really super priority, is the debt. I mean, I have had a history in Madison or a history now of being able to say no. And just like in your own life, you can always see things that you want or think are cool. We have to aggressively say no more in Washington. And one of the things that did surprise me in Washington, a little bit disappointing, is particularly behind closed doors, a lot of Republicans even, when they get there, what do they want to do? They have a neat idea to spend more money. And if you have to lecture them and explain, hey, wait a minute, we have a constitution. There are a limited number of things we can do on a federal level. Every time you turn on the TV at night, if you see a need, does it mean you have to come to the floor of Congress the next day and introduce a bill which have a great idea for us to do. You know, if you see a great thing, fine. Run for the state legislature. They can do it. It's not necessarily something for the federal government to do. So I think those are the big three problems facing the country. There are other things that I'm focusing on. Um, I think even though it's been publicized, the heroin or opiate problem is still not being dealt with the way it should be. Uh, I think there's some things the federal government can do. Um, I think, again, border enforcement would be a, a good thing if they were being more aggressive there. I think when they catch somebody transporting heroin across state lines or having enough that they are dealing in heroin, the penalty should be harsh. I am not a person who believes we'd have to throw a lot more people in prison in this country, but I make one exception, and that is for heroin. We have more people dying of opiates in this state than murder and car accidents combined. And you know how much time we spend agonizing over crime, right? How much time we spend agonizing over car accidents and trying to build, you know, better freeways and telling people to wear their seatbelts and preventing drunk driving. The heroin epidemic is killing more people than both. And I think the federal government ought to be weighing in uh, more on that issue. But that in general is a little bit about me things I think are important. I think the way they set this thing up, correct? If you want to need to kind of ramble on for 35 <laughs> or 40 minutes, there's some things I won't do. I'm not a big one for, for free college for everybody. Like I said, we're broke out of our mind. It is a thing to do between me and my parents. You know, she promises, I don't know where she's going to get the money from, Hillary Clinton. They promise free college for either everybody or a lot more people. <laughs> Man, we're borrowing 14% of our budget. No, I'm not going to do it. But I think now we're going to open up, I guess, for a few questions. As I understand it, afterwards, are we going to get things to eat? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I came here for the cookies. <laughs> well, I guess afterwards we're going to go somewhere. Where Maybe the people. federal government could subsidize a little bit. We lost our oh, no. well, We're going to go to another room when you can talk to me separately. <laughs> that, that, that is always true. We, 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 the room the room. we will do that. Thank you. Now, thank you so much, Connie. Let's have a hand for the Connie. <laughs> Now, Tim Leck, the publisher of, Co of Commonwealth Press, will have a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the public. Okay, here we are. I guess we'll like this. Congressman, you've had a career of being a fiscal conservative. Right. Uh, and three times tonight you talked about 14% of our, of our budget. Right. Is, is right. Debt. It's not paid for. We have a $19 trillion debt, debt as you know. Uh, you have endorsed... Uh, Republican nominee Donald Trump, and um, of course entitlements are anathema, expansion of entitlements are anathema to fiscal conservatives, and yet uh, Mr. Trump has proposed um, paid maternity leave as a new entitlement, and he said that he would pay for it through waste and abuse of unemployment insurance, or unemployment um, disability insurance. Would you, would you 
talk about uh, how you feel about this proposal? Well, <coughs> across the board, and um, as you know, I did not endorse Mr. Trump in the primary. <coughs> and if you listen to Mr. Trump, uh, he's never been elected official before. I can say positive things about him, but across the board, I think he is eager to say he will spend more. Okay. Uh, not only on the paid maternity leave, he has promised a, he wants to make our military very wonderful. So he's clearly promising spending a lot more on sure. the military. He is saying we haven't treated our veterans very well. I think actually we, we put a lot in veterans benefits, but clearly he's promising more in veterans benefits. He has said that Hillary Clinton is spending nowhere near enough on infrastructure. So I think uh, Mr. Trump, who I think it's very important that he win the election in November, but I think when he sits down and puts pen to paper, he's going to find out that, like many first-time candidates, uh, he is promising spending more than he will be able to spend. And, well, I am trying to get along very well with Mr. Trump right now. We have a good relationship with him. Not that great a relationship, but insofar as I know him, I think we have a very nice relationship. I think come January, if he gets elected, there are going to have to be some disagreements between him and me as to how much more we can spend. Of course, Mr. Trump is also promising a lot of tax cuts. And it's true we need a better business climate. It's true right now our corporate income tax rate is very high. We're pushing you know, companies out of this country. Maybe by cutting the rate, we're going to get more jobs, maybe more income, maybe not. But um, I don't know if Mr. Trump at this point has, when he makes all these promises, has really sat down with somebody pushing the pencil and saying, are we working towards a balanced budget here or not? And I think um, Donald Trump, not just for me, but from other people in Congress, he is going to have to get into some disagreements and learn how to compromise. And normally he's going to have to learn to compromise is he's got to stop proposing a lot of new spending programs. And you know, it always sounds good as a politician that sometimes the, the topic of sitcoms on TV, you know, the new politician who's promising things to everybody. Uh, and there are, I think we need um, Donald Trump on immigration. Trump doesn't agree with everything he's doing, but I think even there, I think we need him on government regulation, which is choking business, and I think Donald Trump's going to be very good on government regulation. But I think on uh, balancing the budget, we're going to have to sit down, pencil and paper, and say, this is what this costs, this is what this costs. How are we working on balancing the budget? And uh, I will be disagreeing with him on some of the spending. Thank you. Vigorously, I'll if I may follow up, fiscal conservative is, is really fundamental to you. I mean, I follow your career. Right. It's, it's critical. But right. but he seems to have no concern, as you said, about fiscal discipline. He has not put pencil to paper. Now he's running for president, leader of the free world. That to me seems that you would I would think you would perhaps say, I'm gonna withhold my endorsement. I'm not necessarily gonna I'm not gonna endorse his opponent or opponents. But I'm going to take the Reed Rebel course, and your colleague to the Northeast, who's not running for re-election, I appreciate, and uh, say, until I hear him agree with my, my deeply held principle, I'm not going to give him my nod. Well, whenever I hear on the radio that he's going to spend more money, yeah, my heart kind of sinks a little bit. Be that as it may, there are only two choices here. Okay, um, it is vitally important that we get somebody on the Supreme Court who respects our Constitution and limiting the amount of government. And I think he will do that. I know in private conversations with him, he has talked about excessive government regulation. That wherever he goes, he hears business complaining about excessive government regulation. And he wants to do things to help. And of course, we spend a lot of time in Washington on that regulation. Um, it is very difficult for Congress on its own to deal with this excessive regulation. I mean, if the president wants their way, they pretty much get their way. That's unlike unlike Madison. So when I hear him on those issues, um, I think he realizes, though I'm not a big interventionist, I think he realizes that we're squeezing our military enough. And the military wastes money, don't get me wrong, probably have too many non-military pers personnel there, um, certainly have too many, it's kind of top heavy, too many brass compared to what we've historically been at, but I think, you know, you're, you're not going to get in trouble by having too strong a military. I think he is going to be better there than Hillary. When Hillary Clinton does something like promise new college for all, all these people, it also shows me that she doesn't get the fiscal crisis. So, um, you know, this is a very important election. 
And I know people who are saying they're going to vote for Donald Trump. They're going to say, well, we just have to suck it up and have beef bed judges for another four years. Well, business is just going to have to put up with all this new government regulation, and we'll deal with it in four years from now. Um, we can have four more years of people just streaming across the border. And we don't really have to care about that. We'll worry about enforcing the border in four years when we have who knows how many more million people in this country. Uh, I am not there. I look at the good side right now of Donald Trump and the bad side, which is to a certain extent he's agreeing to spend too much more. I'm willing to fight him on that in January. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other question, and then I will uh, let uh, our great audience ask questions. I've written, I've written a couple of editorials, uh, and it's easy for me to write something in my office and then start the presses, and I never have to face uh, the people that I talk about. And I talked about you a couple times. Uh, well, actually, you and then Congressman Petra, your predecessor, in regard to Oshkosh Corporation. And Oshkosh Corporation is giving these huge defense contracts to mm -hmm. build joint light um, military vehicles. And they're great contracts. Somebody's got to get them. And, and Good for us, we got them in, our, in your district, 6th District. But then when the contract expires, the federal government and you and your predecessor, Tom Petri, announced it, then the region is given more money to kind of buttress the effect of people losing the contract. Now, I work for a commercial printing company, and we like contracts, and we like big business. When we lose the business, we have to find other business to make the presses run or we have to have furlough days, or layoffs, or freeze wages. That's the way it works in free enterprise. But the government says, and you seem to endorse the notion that when, and then I'll be quiet, Oshkosh Corporation loses, the, or the contract expires, then you give more money. Not promised, not contracted, they just get more dollars to kind of soften the blow and keep the defense, and literally your words, keep the defense employees um, viable, economically viable. How can you defend that as somebody who rails against it, uh, corporate or, or, or personal welfare? This is sort of corporate welfare. Um, well, it's not corporate welfare as much as it is, you know, a government program designed to encourage economic growth. Um, and that program had previously been authorized. Uh, the money is coming here. And I'm glad the money is coming here. Uh, what if you took a stand as, and say that, and, that, and, that and, has no reason to exist? And, I don't think. I'll put it this way, okay. diplomatically. All right. That is not a priority to me. But why don't you refuse to say I will not announce it? Because I don't agree with it, unless you do agree with it. Um, well, I was asked to announce it. The, uh, the grant was given. And I can tell you, I think you can tell by my philosophy, that is not a priority. I mean, not, there are all sorts of government programs I don't consider a priority. I'm not going to run around Washington saying, oh, this program's been appropriated. I want none of it to come to Wisconsin. Okay? Any more than, say, the university. I don't know what you're getting here in Ripon, but I know a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, research grants are going to the University of Wisconsin and Madison. Okay? I'm not going to say, well, um, let's, let's start balancing the budget by not giving research grants to the University of Wisconsin and Madison. That would be a strange thing for me to do. <laughs> I think I've made it clear that we're spending too much money all sorts of ways. Um, and I don't think in future budgets um, you're going to see me fighting to have the government involved in a lot of local um, economic development programs of that nature. Thank, thank you very way. much. Okay. And I'll, I'll be quiet and uh, we'll welcome your questions. Okay. Thank you, Jim. We, Thank you. we have about 20 minutes or so for questions, so um, state your question, and then I will do my best to rephrase it as succinctly as possible so that our videographic can pick it up, and that will give a minute or two for the congressman to think about his answer, and we'll take it from there. So, audience is yours. Yeah. Um, you've stated multiple times that your district leads the country in uh, manufacturing jobs. And uh, how do you believe Hillary Clinton's tax plan and regulations will affect those uh, job numbers? Okay. Uh, the question is that um, um, the congressman has stated that your district leads the state in manufacturing jobs. How will Hillary Clinton's tax plan affect that? Um, well, as you know right now, for corporations, our tax bracket is is higher than anywhere else in the industrialized world. And 
like it or not, we're dealing with a lot of multinational corporations today. It's the type of thing where they're paying 35% in one country and 15% in another country. Uh, you know, these, these giant corporations, some of which run by people who aren't even American, they're going to look at that number and say, you know, am I going to save money here, save money there? It puts the United States at a disadvantage. We have a special problem uh, in that they are right now going after coal, of course, and uh, energy is a big cost for a lot of manufacturers. As long as we aggressively go after coal, and Wisconsin is a coal-heavy state, it's going to make the energy costs higher in, in uh, Wisconsin and other states and other countries. That's a huge problem. There are other regulations going on out there, be it the EPA regulations, be it Department of Labor regulations in particular, which, you know, more paperwork. There comes a point at which people say, I don't know if I want to be here. I believe very strongly in manufacturing. I believe strongly in manufacturing even before I realized that the 6th Congressional District has more manufacturing jobs in it than anywhere else in the country. Think about that. 435 districts, more here. Wouldn't you think if you said what district has the most manufacturing jobs? Say Chicago, you know, Detroit, some someplace like that. No, it's a little old. You know, this district based in Oshkosh and Sheboygan and Fond du Lac, that's where you have the jobs. Um, so it is a priority because manufacturing is what makes your country wealthy. Okay? There are all sorts of other things. I used to be a lawyer. Having a lot of lawyers doesn't make your country wealthy, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna say, let's let's graduate a million people from law school and we're all gonna be wealthier. Manufacturing is the most important thing. And I made it a priority before and I'm gonna continue to make it a priority. We want to be the place where not just somebody starting out here, although we have to look out for startups too, but where anybody comparing, you know, Wisconsin to Ohio to Ireland to wherever, we are as competitive as can be. And I, I don't think Hillary Clinton, like many people in Washington, really understands how fragile business is. I mean, you hear all the time, you know, people laying people off factories closing. I think right now we're a little bit of an upswing, but our priority has to always be to help business and manufacturing and agriculture above all, because that's where your wealth comes from. Thank you. Another question? Yes. The situation in Syria has been pretty much a mess for the past number of years now. Um, men, women, and children die countless numbers every day. It seems as though Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump both support the establishment of safe zones in Syria. If, first of all, are you in favor of establishing these safe zones? And if so, who's going to be establishing them? Is it going to be the United States, NATO? Who, who's going to be spearheading that operation? Um, so the question is that uh, both candidates for presidents have endorsed creating safe zones in Syria where civilians can be protected. The question is who is going to establish those? United States, NATO, United Nations? Um, I think it's going to be a combination. I think the Russians uh, may have to get involved because in order to do them, you, you've got so many different uh, different actors, right? Uh, you have so many different rebel groups, one of which is ISIS, which is horrible. Um, you have Syria, which historically has been kind of a barbaric regime, though, to be honest. Uh, people could stand for them 10 years ago. Russia right now has troops in there is very engaged in helping the Syrian government. Um, I don't think that Syria was somebody we talked about in that region six years ago, but there's somebody who's a player now. And I think everybody agrees that we have a humanitarian nightmare in Syria. So uh, it could be the United Nations, now that they're necessarily have a great track record of doing things so far, but I think between the United States Russia, um, United Nations, people have to sit around the table and say, where are these zones going to be? I'll also say this. I think it is unrealistic right now to expect returning to the borders of 10 years ago in Syria. Okay, the hard feelings are such that to ever expect um, the Sunni minority or majority in Syria to live under the old borders is to expect a permanent uh, nightmare. And there are also problems in Iraq the same way. I mean, we've had such a long civil war there, the idea that ever again you're going to have the old Iraq borders is questionable. 
So I think the new president, you can do it under the auspices of the United Nations, but we know who the principal players are as well. Uh, somewhere along the road, I think we're going to need a new Sunni nation uh, comprised to a certain extent of the eastern part of Syria and the western part of Iraq. Um, because you know, we've had this ongoing war in Iraq and the ongoing war in Syria. And I think the hard feelings are such that to hold either country together like they used to be is going to almost create a, a permanent state of civil war. Thank you, Congressman. Another question? Yes, Gary. Uh, my question has to do with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, recently, I was talking to some people in the 6th District who worked at a company, at a small company, and they said in the past they routinely would maybe work 10 hours, of, 10 hours a week of overtime, and, and that made a pretty good living for them. With the advent of the Affordable Care Act, their employer put them on part-time status, and so then they had to go out to make a living, they had to go out and get another job, and so life is more difficult now because instead of just having one job, they have to have maybe two or three jobs to, um, to live. How would you respond to all Okay. The question is that the Affordable uh, um, Health Care Act has um, influenced employers to reduce work time for employees so that their contributions to the health care goes down, but then it means that people have to get a second job. So well, how would you address that? Well, I'll, I'll give you another anecdote along the same line. And these people who came up to this thing, I don't think they seem to realize that when you change the rules or put strong economic incentives on business or other people, it changes the way we behave. Uh, a similar area is your Obamacare subsidies goes out at certain levels, right? Like maybe you make more than $60,000 a year, whatever it is, depending upon your situation. All of a sudden, you lose a subsidy. It can be thousands of dollars. Okay, so if, you know, if I say I make one more dollar, I'm going to lose several thousand dollars. I'm going to make sure I don't make another dollar. So here's going another way. We have somebody who in the past worked overtime or would like to be promoted by the boss. And I, I've been told this by accountants, and I think it's true. Uh, people are now mindful of the fact that if I make any more money, I'm losing my Obamacare subsidy, so I want to artificially keep my income down, which is another bad thing, because we want everybody in America to thrive in their career. We want them all to look for raises, look for overtime, and the Affordable Care Act really, and I, I don't blame the people for doing it, I, I probably would too if I was at that limit, um, discourages people from having their career advance because it tells you you shouldn't work anymore. As you know, I'm opposed to Obamacare. I've always been opposed to Obamacare. Um, I think it was put together by people who um, don't realize that people's behavior changes in response to economic incentives. Um, I'll tell you an anecdote, just a fun anecdote. Um, I am on the Economic Committee in Washington. And I talked to Alice Rivlin, who I don't know if you know her. She's a famous famous economist, famous liberal economist, liberal, liberal economist. And I presented this situation to her, that I thought people were working less hard because of Obamacare. And she told me she couldn't believe it. Now, if you were going to lose thousands of dollars by working and earning another thousand dollars, would you work hard? No, you'd say, wait a minute, i got to pay attention here. I can't take overtime. i got to turn down the rates. She didn't believe that Obamacare was causing people to, to, to to change their behavior. If she wouldn't believe that, do you think the people who put it together understood the fact that if a business is over X number of employees, they're going to have to make sure they don't hire anybody new or put some of their people on part-time? I just think the people who put that together were so economically illiterate. I would like to get rid of Obamacare. I think as long as we have the government weighing in to such an important segment of the economy, uh, they are again, again, again going to screw things up. I think the goal has to be, because we can't just pull it all together because such a large number of people are on Obamacare right now. But the idea is to phase things back where people, again, it's their own responsibility, just like the past, to a degree to pay for their health care. Um, I do believe that government involvement is one of the reasons why health care costs spiraled up so much in the first place. I think if you look at things that are the government did not get involved in, Thing like LASIK surgery, things like cosmetic surgery, the cost fell. And I think 
by having more buy-in by people across the board on replacement of Obamacare, you're going to have the cost of other things fall as well. It might be interesting, you know, we've had healthcare costs go up by so much, I think people kind of consider it a given. Like it's always going to go up. But you might want to look at the cost of cosmetic surgery or LASIK surgery over the last 20 years and see what happens. This is not inevitable. And as we go for a more free market approach, assuming we get a president who can go to repeal Obamacare, I think we can begin to have medical costs fall in this country. If you look at innovative corporations, um, talk to CEOs of them, I think they could get their total cost, not just the cost of the corporation, but the overall cost what the corporation is paying plus what the employees are paying to drop 30 or 35 percent. And if we did that, we wouldn't have the medical crisis we have now in this country. That's a possible thing to do and something we have to aim for. Thank you. I talked to somebody from Germany. I talked to somebody who's not a border. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, um, just to continue on that topic, why is it that every other industrialized country in the world can afford national health care and we can't? There are all sorts of things other countries can repeat the question. No, oh, should be. Sure, he wants to know why we don't have national health care when places like Canada or England or what have you have national health care. Um, I think our health care is a little bit superior, but you have to remember, America is a freer country. I mean, across the board, you look at the percentage of the, uh, the gross domestic product that is spent on government-related things in the United States compared to other countries, it's lower here. And I think that's because, well, I'll quote Ronald Reagan, the Europeans didn't come to this country to copy Europe. They came here for something better. Um, or that's kind of a <laughs> um, I think if you want a free country, you have to have more of that country being controlled by the individual, not the government. And as is true of health care, as is true of many other things that I think are subsidized more in other countries, people come here because they want the freedom. And if you're going to have the government control the medical system lock, stock, and barrel, you're inevitably taking away some freedom. It's just an American thing. There are plenty of countries around the world in which the government does a lot more for you than the United States. I think in most cases, people from those countries are always looking to come here more than the other way around. Follow up on that or a different topic? Kristen? Where's our German guy? Oh, German guy. I want to see what it looks like. All right. All right. Uh, looking at uh, you know, legal, Im legal immigration, right. if you're looking, so roughly two thirds of legal immigration is actually family based, roughly one third employment based. And I'm wondering. How would you change that mix of, uh, of legal immigrants coming here? Would you change that mix? And overall, looking at the employment-based immigrants, do you think we need more or less people in let's say, agriculture or, or construction? Or do you want more people from the STEM fields? I'm wondering, what is the right mix? I think you need people from all over the place, but I do think. The question is, would you change the mix of our immigration policies? Some people come family ties, some employment. Would you change that? And among it, um, jobs or skills, would you change the quotas on the skills that we need? We need more employment-based immigration. Okay, Our immigration policy should be that to benefit the United States. Okay, um, It's not up to us to take somebody, family immigration, if they are not going to help the United States. You know, if you have somebody, let's face it, I think, I think Retired people add a great deal uh, of value to our country. But if you have somebody come here who's near retirement, retirement age, they probably are going to take more out of the system they're going to give back. And we are already broke out of our mind, as great as we've discussed. So if we take people who we do not think are an asset to this country, we are only slitting our throat more on that 14% that we're already borrowing. Um, I am not somebody who believes you just have to take some people in the STEM field. I mean, you look around this country, and I hate it when they use the word unskilled job. That's ridiculous. Again and again, I see people doing what some people call unskilled jobs, and like, I wouldn't know how to do that job. But I think we need people all over the place. We need people in the hospitality field. We need people in agriculture, and we need some people in the STEM field, too. I think it has to change from time to time, but depending upon where the needs are, that's where the immigrants should go. But every immigrant who comes here uh, the goal should be to take somebody who is going to take a job and have that job for a long period of time. Question in the back, Christian. 
Yes, um, your opponent in this race was here a little bit ago, uh, and one of the, her main sticking points that she talked about, uh, and is very close to my heart, is agricultural policy, um, and what she would do to promote farms, especially the dairy industry in this part of Wisconsin. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of something about how you would treat uh, agriculture, and especially how you would uh, promote uh, dairy farming and really the farming lifestyle, um, so it doesn't go down as much if we don't have farmers uh, leaving? Well, the, question, the question is that when your opponent was here, she addressed the agricultural issue in Wisconsin, and one of her concerns was the decline of the family farm. So what would you do to keep encouraging uh, agriculture in this country, in the state, and also that the lifestyle of, of, of farmers would be enhanced or would be more attractive? It's, um, I consider myself a friend of the family farm. Um, I have been endorsed by the largest agriculture organization in the state, and I was routinely endorsed by them uh, during my state legislative career as well, because they know I do what I can for them. Obviously, we're going through a difficult time there, in that larger farms um, are, you know, if you tour them, are sometimes very economical. And I can't remember the percentage of American labor that was involved in agriculture in the year 1900, but it was high. It was over half. Everybody was on a farm. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid around here, I don't think it was unusual to have people with a 35 to 40 to 60 cow Farm. And over time, there's less of that, let's face it. Um, I will continue to do what I can to be pro-agriculture. I am not somebody who wants to necessarily charge into something in which we cannot sell our, our produce abroad. Um, because depending on the year, and right now things are tough because the value of the dollar is high, which is hurting agriculture as well as other things. But I think we have to continue to push to keep those markets open abroad. I think as far as a new agriculture bill comes up, I'm going to be very mindful. You sometimes say in the past that some of these programs disproportionately affect the big farmer. And while I'm not on the agriculture committee, I will be very mindful of that fact when the new farm bill comes out. Um, and, you know, again and again, it's not just agriculture, but again and again when you talk to people in business, they will tell you there's nothing better than hiring somebody, a kid who grew up on a farm. You know, they feel it's, it's better off if they have it almost a gem automatically. Um, obviously, I don't even want to go back to the days in which whatever it was, 60 or 70 percent or whatever it was in 1900, working in agriculture. I don't think our population would go there. And I think it's, it's sad, but obviously it makes our whole country a lot wealthier that, you know, we have a smaller percentage working on farms now. But um, in the Ag Bill, I will be very mindful of the fact that it is good for the country to have a lot of smaller farms. Um, I, I don't have the, the numbers at my fingertips, but obviously the number of farms in the state of Wisconsin has dropped dramatically over the last 40 years. Just shocking. And part of it is just the production of the farm. I mean, you know, if you tour one of these farms today, you know, people are now you know, milk the cows three times a day rather than two times a day, like when I grew up, okay? Obviously, that's a big deal. And you go through some of these big farms and it's incredible. Just like when you go through a factory today. The number of people working in factories today is a fraction of what it was 60 years ago. And when you tour the factory, you can see why. I mean, it's just incredibly efficient. And the farms are getting incredibly efficient. But um, I will, like I said, I'll weigh in trying to get us more markets abroad. And um, I, I do listen to the experts in the field, which is why I have always been endorsed by the largest farm organization in the state. And I will be paying particular attention when we look at the provisions of the new Ag Bill, even though I don't expect to be on the Ag Committee. Uh, look at them to make sure that we do not do anything uh, that hurts the smaller farmer more. Because, you know, in a lot of ways, sentimentally, I wish we did have a lot of 40. Sentimentally, it would be nice if we were back in the 40 to 60 cow days, but I don't think we're going to be able to do that. Another question? Yes. I have a question about the Oversight Committee, because right. I do watch the CNN to some degree. And it doesn't appear that the Oversight Committee has any responsibility as to, other than to um, 
go after people who supposedly have done something wrong, but there's never any resolution or solution. It they're you know they're they're spanked verbally and then they're sent on their way. That's the way Congress works. The question, the comment, the question is that would, if this um, uh, woman watches the C-SPAN of the Oversight Committee and it seems that they will um, criticize or um, expose people who uh, have not been accountable with their with, with government money. But what 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 kind of real results or punishments are meted out by the Oversight Committee? Well, uh, we recently held somebody in contempt. Um, we have recommended impeachment, uh, but the way Congress works is every committee has a committee chair, and that committee chair is kind of a fiefdom of that area. So a lot of these will wind up in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, the way it works is the Oversight Committee, I wish it were more important. It's my busiest committee, we're meeting all the time. But usually what happens is they identify a problem, they make recommendations, uh, the chairman or other people in that committee may introduce bills, but then depending upon the area, be it the Transportation Committee, uh, Energy and Commerce, what have you, the chairman and the people of that committee make the final product. And I think the Oversight Committee is a very busy committee. I haven't seen the totals. I wouldn't be surprised to meet more than anybody else. And I think they do have an impact embarrassing people into acting appropriately. And I think sometimes they recommend bills that come out of other committees, maybe not as quickly as we'd like. So it's a relevant committee, but I think, and I'd like to make it more relevant, I could talk about it at length, but I wish we'd change the committee structure. I think as long as the committee structure is there right now, I think the chairman of the standing committee do not want their authority taken away. We sometimes do introduce Bill, by the way, but a lot of times we don't. We have time for one more question. Gentlemen. Yeah, I, I got one statement first off is, uh, your predecessor, Tom Petride, was very good at uh, holding public listening sessions. So far, I don't know at all that you've held anything like that, and I would certainly encourage you to do that. Uh, the other thing is, as far as complaining about the size of the Navy, the size of the planes and that, I think one thing you need to look at is, uh, say for example, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, uh, you spend a ton of money on it. I just was looking on my cell phone the other day or to, during this, this meeting as far as the cost of the plane comes without the engine. I don't know that they're gliders. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's ridiculous. And also, too, is even, even our Marinette Marinet Marine with the uh, combat littoral ships. They're having a lot of problems with those engines breaking down. Matter of fact, the first two copies now have been pulled out of service to be used just as research vessels to see what's wrong with them. How do it, you know, you keep talking about we need more, we need more uh, money for defense and you know, our Navy is down, our Air Force is down, when you have boondoggles like this. The question is what do you do okay. about um, cost overruns on defense contracts like the F-35 and some, okay. and some ships. How do you bring that into control? He, he, he really had a couple questions. Uh, the first one is, am I accessible enough for questions? I'm here tonight. Um, like I said, in my first two years, I, I have not, you know, when I'm back, I always stay in the state of Wisconsin. And I think I'm about as accessible legislators as it is. I think compared to days in the past, legislators collectively do not hold as much office hours as in the past. Though I have held office hours, if you pay attention, you know, I'm out there. Uh, somebody's taping them. I'll give you by comparison of the Rick Ripple to the North, and he told me I might be wrong on this. He never held an office hour in his six years on the job. And I've chosen not to go down that way. I do show up. Um, but otherwise, I'm back all the time. If you have a strong opinion on something, you can call my office in Fond du Lac. Be happy to meet with you. And uh, I, I am certain there is nobody in Congress who spends much more time running around his district asking questions of people uh, than I do. As far as the military wasting money, I'm not an expert on it, but I do believe they waste money. There was a, uh, a um, uh, during the military appropriation bill, there was a proposal to reduce spending across the board by 1%, and very few Republicans voted for it. I voted for it because I do believe that there is waste in the military. Not only I think a procurement is sometimes too much, but as I mentioned, the military is top heavy, I think they have too many civilian personnel. Um, on procurement, I agree that things have to be tightened up a lot. 
I'll be honest with you, it's not a committee that I'm on, so I haven't thrown myself into that issue. Uh, but I do bring it up with people on the appropriate committee and hope they will be paying attention in the future. Congressman, thank you so much for sharing with us this evening. Let's give a nice round of applause. <laughs> before we break up. Next week we have two events that the Center for Politics and the People is sponsoring. Um, on Monday evening at uh, 4.15 here in Little Theater, we'll have a, dis a discussion on how much influence money has in politics today and in policy making. And a public advocacy lawyer from Washington, D.C., David Halpern, will be here, and my colleague Henrik Schatzinger will engage him in conversation. Um, on Wednesday night, we have an alumna of Ripon College, um, <coughs> Catherine Schultz, who is working in the State Department on arms control. And she will be speaking at 4.15 here on Wednesday evening on her work on the United States government trying to limit the spread of nuclear technology and to have countries uh, observe the non-proliferation treaty that they've signed. So she'll be here at 4.15 on Wednesday. Thank you all for coming. We hope to see you again soon. <laughs>